still morning, right? Yes. Good morning, everybody. May I ask you to take your seats? Frederica, we are going to start. Please take your seat. See, that works. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. My name is Boris Dietrich. I'm a senator in the Netherlands, the country that hosts the International Criminal Court, and we are very uh, proud of that. Um, and it's my honor to moderate this session. Um, and while you are seated, we will, we will first start with a video message, a video message from uh, Karim Khan, and Karim Khan is the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Um, I think the video is about 20 minutes, and after the video, we will start questions and answers, and then, of course, uh, it's up to you to ask a question to the distinguished panelists. But first, we start with a video message. So, take it away. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, excellencies, it's a real pleasure for me and indeed a privilege to have the opportunity to say a few words on this very important gathering. I'm really sorry I can't be with you at this 12th Consultative Assembly of Parliamentarians for the ICC and the Rule of Law and a remarkable achievement, the 43rd Annual Forum of Parliamentarians for Global Action. You have so much to be proud of. Since the Parliamentarians for Global Action was formed in 1978, you have led in so many fora on the issue of accountability, the rule of law, good governance and justice. You have played a very important role in the International Criminal Court and I understand that 78 out of the 123 state parties owe you also a debt of gratitude because you facilitated, advised and assisted those states to join up to the Rome, St Rome Statute system. I'm really delighted and honoured to have the opportunity to speak. So thank you, Senator Lucila Crexel of Argentina, President of CAP ICC, to the Honourable Castori Patel of Malaysia, and of course to the legend, the legendary David Donat Catan, Secretary General of PGA, for his years of tireless and dedicated service. The work of Parliamentarians for Global Action needs no introduction. One of the aims, of course, was accountability and nuclear disarmament and at least trying to prevent nuclear escalation. I understand at least that was one of the core motivators when PGA was started and also in relation to the ICC applaud the work of the Honourable Erwin Cutler who was the first president of CAP ICC. We are, of course, as you know, better than me, at a very pivotal moment in world affairs. Recovering from the terrible pandemic of COVID, with the debts that many countries have fallen into because of those strictures, we are facing conflict in myriad parts of the world. If you look at the work of the office, the 16 situations I've inherited, if you look at situations in Latin America, Afghanistan, Philippines, Israel, Palestine, North, West, East, Central Africa, uh, Georgia, look at Ukraine. We see this con continued proclivity of man, of governments, of armed groups, to act in a way that is no longer acceptable, in a way that has not been acceptable for a long time, to engage in wanton destruction, to target children and women, 
to engage in gender persecution, to unleash the powers of technology by of multiple rocket launchers and missiles upon those that are extremely vulnerable, to spread terror, discontent. And the work of Parliamentarians for Global Action is essential to bring together you as elected politicians of very real standing, of august histories and of seniority to show that the rule of law is not some optional extra. It is not some concept that we speak about in universities or in chambers of justice, but is something that directly links to peace and security and to actually the possibility of tomorrow. In a world where the environment represents such an existential threat to the continuation of humanity, we are also in so many parts of the world engaged in action that is causing death, disfigurement and destruction on individuals but on communities. We've seen it in ISIS, in Iraq, in Syria, in parts of West Africa. We see it in other theatres around the world. So this is a moment where we need to stand united. Not only you as parliamentarians for global action, as parliamentarians dedicated to have better tomorrow, parliamentarians that have given an oath to your constitutions, to your legal systems and to your people, but also regardless of the national boundary and state that you represent or come from, we have to be alive to the suffering of our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because if we don't, the consequences also affect each and every one of us. We see that instability in one country affects others. Look at the situation in Myanmar. Many countries around the world, Malaysia, Bangladesh, Thailand, are destabilized, suffer, have to carry and pay the price because of allegations and conduct in another part of the world. We see the same in Latin America, we see the same in Ukraine. So the law at this moment is not an optional extra. I have said in different fora that it has to be seen for what it is, which in my respectful submission is one of the anchors for peace and stability and security. It is one of the promises, one of the prerequisites in fact, to ensure that our children have the best chance for a tomorrow governed not by the Wild West, not governed by power of the bully and the dictator and the tyrant, but by something more civilized, which is the law. And when we come to the law, what I said when I was sworn in, sworn in as prosecutor of the ICC on the 16th of June, is something that I feel with every fiber of my body, that the Rome Statute that 123 states have signed up to is owned by all of you, by countries that practice the civil law system, countries that practice the common law system, countries that practice Islamic law or Chinese law, or countries that are completely secular. It represents the shared heritage of humanity born out of tears and suffering, whether it is the gas chambers of the Holocaust, whether it is the detention centers of the former Yugoslavia, the killing fields of Cambodia, or the rampant crime we've seen in other parts of the world, whether it's the special court, uh, Sierra Leone, or the crimes that are adjudicated by our independent, impartial judges of the International Criminal Court. This is very important because whilst the headquarters of the court is here, far away from Latin America where you meet at the moment, it's here in The Hague, it needs to be seen as close to you, each and every one of you, whichever continent of the world you come from, whether you're from the Southern Hemisphere or the Northern Hemisphere, but beyond the elites 
of which, however humble you are, you represent. It needs to resonate with people in villages, in towns, in restaurants and in the streets as something that is more than a talk shop, but something that protects their rights and is part of their future. This year has been an extraordinarily busy year for the court. In fact, it's been a challenging two years. The president of the court, the president of the assembly of state parties, the registrar of the court, the men and women of the court, the office, all actors involved in justice deserve a massive thank you for carrying on with the quest of justice during the most difficult days of COVID. And the result has been activity. This year alone, the judges of the court have dealt with the first confirmation hearing in uh, the Said case in the Central African Republic, the beginning of that trial, with the first trial arising out of the Security Council referral in the Sudan situation in the case against Mr. Ali Kusheib, also known as Mr. Abdurrahman. It has had new arrests that have been received here in The Hague. We've opened situations in Venezuela, we've closed preliminary examinations in Colombia and in Guinea, and of course opened investigations uh, in uh, Ukraine as well. Yesterday, the independent judges of the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court authorized me to continue investigating allegations arising out of Afghanistan. We need to move forward, we need to build partnerships, and we need to deliver. How do we do that? We do that by trying to keep improving communication. I need to improve my communication, but also we need to make others, you as decision makers, realize with ever greater vitality that we need your help. This court is as strong as you. It is as strong as your governments and as strong as your institutions. We need to be dedicated to justice and realize justice cannot be left an orphan. It requires that consistent support. We're trying to engage in ever better ways in the regions. We've had discussions with the president of the court and the registrar at looking at various options that are under discussion, including uh, regional hubs in Asia or in Latin America. As an office, we're trying to have ever better field presence, whether it is in Caracas or whether it is in Kyiv or whether it is in Khartoum, we need to be closer with the people. We need to understand the history, the culture, the needs, the wants of victims and witnesses and have a better compass to separate truth from falsehood so that we can present ever better evidence, ever more reliable evidence to our independent judges of the court who then can listen to the defence and legal representatives of victims and decide where the truth lies. And we're very lucky to have those independent judges to rely upon. It also requires us to embrace new technology. We are building with the assistance, particularly of the registrar, with the trust fund that I launched in March of this year and the support of many states, um, new technologies that will allow us to do better work faster. The mass data sets that we see in almost all the situations now, but particularly one can talk about Myanmar or Ukraine, but the list goes on, requires us to understand massive data sets, whether it's social media, Facebook or TikTok or cell site evidence or testimonial evidence. We need the, the technological architecture to deal with that quickly, to grapple with it, to dissect it, and then understanding what that information shows, try to build strong cases in relation to those that may be responsible for Rome statute crimes for the judges to ultimately decide upon. Using those tools like machine learning, voice to text translation, are not optional extras. They are tools that will allow this court, in my respectful view, 
to be sustainable. Because we have to understand the physical environment we're in. We need your help. The court in December is presenting a budget. And many of you come from governments, I think every country around the world, that are feeling the pain. Whether it's energy prices or interest rates or the results of COVID, are feeling the pain about how to use resources effectively. The budget that the court is putting forward is very modest in my view, certainly peanuts compared to the billions being spent on armaments or in terms of dealing with refugees around the world. We are dedicated to try to show in ever more vivid ways the impact of international criminal justice. But what we need you to do really, if I can be so candid, is to go back to your capitals and advocate for us in your parliaments, with your treasuries, with your foreign ministries, to say we don't just speak the language of justice, nor do we simply sign and rest when our signature is in the ratification of the Rome Statute, but we're going to support this court because it reflects us and our values and our hopes for the future. Using this technology is also key because I've said repeatedly, the ICC, in my view, is not clearly an apex court. It is a hub. The types of criminality we see around the world is often so vast, it is so complex. No one legal system, no one court, no one chamber, no one prosecutor can deal with it by themselves. And the hub that we are trying to create in the office of the prosecutor is one where we can use technology, build partnerships, analyze, receive, organize, dissect evidence and information ourselves, put cases to our judges to decide, but also a hub that can give evidence and information to your national systems, to your national police, your national prosecutors, who in turn can present it to your national judges to ensure that there's no impunity, that collectively we share the burden of responsibility to make sure that there's no safe haven in 2022 or in the future for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or where we have jurisdiction, the crime of aggression. This requires a partnership and we're trying to do it in many different ways. In terms of Ukraine, we signed for the first time in the history of the office an agreement to be a participant in a joint investigative team with seven other countries. Just in the last month or so, I also signed an agreement to join a joint investigative team in relation to the Libya situation, partnering with Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, and uh, also um, the Netherlands. These cooperation in teams are something we need more of because it's born from this joint obligation. International justice is too important to leave to judges or to prosecutors or to national authorities. It requires this cross-border partnerships and this collective resolve. So as battles loom, and as in 2022, when we have enough to be dealing with in terms of economic woes and travails, as the youth raise their voice in remarkable ways regarding the environment, we realize that in certain quarters, people are talking about tactical nuclear weapons. If this moment does not wake us up and motivate us to action, what on earth will? The future is ours to craft. It is our responsibility to safeguard that future for our next generation. But it, it requires your resolve and our efficiency to work together independently, impartially, but with a belief that the law can help carve out a future for tomorrow and that a world without law is a world without future. Those partnerships bring results. In the last couple of weeks, 
I had the honor of publicly announcing that the office of the prosecutor played a role in facilitating the ability of Italy and the Kingdom of the Netherlands to extradite and have transferred from Ethiopia individuals to those domestic systems for allegations of people trafficking. That is a direct result of partnership. And there will be accountability in the courts of Italy and in the court of Netherlands in relation to conduct which is alleged to have caused misery and loss. That's the potential. That's what we can do. We can do much more together with your help. Thank you so much for giving me the great honour to say a few words on this really important event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan, although he doesn't hear us here in this hall. Um, before I open the floor to questions and answers, I think it's important to mention that if you would have a question for Mr. Khan, the prosecutor of the ICC, maybe it's better to write it down and to deliver it to uh, the PGA staff, and we will distribute it to Mr. Khan, and we will take care, hopefully, that you will get your answer. But let's make use of our time to um, have a question and answers with uh, Judge Silvia Fernandez uh, Gurmendi, the President of the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and of course to Judge Piotr Hofmanski, the President of the International Criminal Court. And you've heard them before the coffee break. So let me now open the floor. We have until about one o'clock. Um, so that's about 15 minutes. Who can I give uh, the floor? And I see uh, on my left side, Miriam, the um, member of parliament from Afghanistan. And we all know that uh, Afghanistan, uh, when the Taliban took over, the members of parliament had to flee the country. Miriam uh, took refuge in, I believe, the United States, uh, but of course is still a member of the parliament in Afghanistan. May I give you the floor, Miriam? Yeah. Okay, first and foremost, thank you for having me. Um, we're in the midst of in a, a crisis in Afghanistan. Um, not just for one group or one people, but the entire country. I do have three questions. Um, if you allowed me all day, I could be asking you questions in regards well, we, to the atrocities. No, we in don't allow that. <laughs> yeah. The current Minister of Interior of the Taliban, Sarajuddin Haqqani, head of the notorious Haqqani Network, who was behind some of the most gruesome attacks against Afghan civilians, and who has publicly boasted about how he has personally trained and orchestrated 1,050 suicide attacks in Afghanistan. What is the ICC going to do about bringing him to justice? Let's slow down a little bit for the interpretation. Okay. So that's your first question? Yes. Yes, continue. My second question is, how can Afghanistan have justice? How can the international community end cycles of violence and impunity? What can we do as Afghan civil society to support this cause? What can we take to ensure the voices of Afghan women are heard, political prisoners are freed, and the country is able to move forward without violence and terrorism? My third question. Yes, is the Taliban have started a major campaign of killing and forced disappearances of former Afghan security forces. What is the ICC doing to ensure that such large-scale atrocities do not go unnoticed and that the perpetrators will be held accountable? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's best to have the answers immediately um, because I think that the questions will be different from each other. 
And so let me uh, give the floor to, to you for an answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid that I am not able to give the, the, the answer on your questions, especially in respect to the first and the third one, because they concern the pending situation before the court. Uh, as you know, I am not only the president of the court, but also the judge of the court, and I am fully independent. I cannot express my opinions and um, I cannot even share the information because everything um, is now in the hands of the prosecutor. Therefore, I think that this question could be addressed to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and follow the procedure you proposed. Uh, the, the second question is a more general uh, in its nature. Uh, what can be done uh, to ensure justice for Afghanistan? And I think that the, it's, uh, of course, the political situation in the country makes this, this, uh, this task more difficult than in maybe in other countries. Uh, but it does not mean that we, we, should, we should give up. So uh, I, I fully understand how difficult is the situation of the prosecutor in respect to the situation in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan. And I also know how difficult um, it is to uh, encourage the uh, national courts to deal with these issues. This is um, um, challenging, but um, you know, our, uh, our goal, our task is to do everything possible to ensure that the victims will be done, but it is not always possible. Thank you so much. And now I'll give the floor to Mrs. Fernandez de Grumendi. Maybe you can answer a little bit more. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your questions. In the microphone. Oh, in the microphone. Thank you for your questions. Uh, of course, I am not uh, the prosecutor either. Uh, but I just uh, would like to, to recall something that he has said uh, at the beginning of his uh, statement, which I think it is quite informative. Uh, as you know, the uh, prosecutor is investigating in Afghanistan. Uh, this is, uh, and he has uh, publicly announced this. And yesterday there was something important at the court because the uh, judges have uh, authorized him to continue this investigation. Uh, as you well know, there were, or maybe you, well, you may know, uh, that is, um, there was a request for him to suspend the investigation, and yesterday he was authorized to resume. So I think this is extremely important. It's a first step. It's a first step to bring perpetrators to justice in Afghanistan. Now, you say, what can, how can the court bring perpetrators to justice? How, what can the, uh, the court do to uh, have justice in Afghanistan. I think the, the, the question is, what can also the international community do to support the court to bring perpetrators before justice? Not only in Afghanistan, everywhere. Uh, and uh, again, I go back to the words of the prosecutor, which are extremely sound. First of all, not one single institution in the world can do this alone because we are talking about massive criminality, systemic criminality, so indeed the court can only do a small piece of this. Uh, so the, and the court can only do this small piece with, a hu with the support of the international community. Cooperation, political support, and of course financial support. So all of you uh, parliamentarians of the world can also help the court by uh, trying to uh, put pressure inside your own countries to make sure that the respective governments do give enough support to the court. So, uh, and again, uh, as I said, the court cannot do this alone, and the, the court and the prosecutor has announced this many times. It is, and I, I fully endorse this view, and I've said it myself as well, the court needs to work in partnerships with others. It is working with the United Nations. It is working with national systems. The court can share information, but also it, they, they need the support and information that can bring, be brought by others. So um, I, I think that is what I can add to, to, your, to, to your queries at this point. Thank you so much. And the questions that have not been answered, we will submit them to the prosecutor 
and you will get your answer from him, hopefully. Um, the second one I would like to give the floor to is the representative of Argentina. Please take the floor. Muchas gracias. Quisiera hacer dos preguntas, una dirigida al presidente de la CPI. Voy a hacer dos preguntas, la primera dirigida al presidente de la CPI, la segunda dirigida a la presidenta de la Asamblea de Estados Parte. Eh, lo primero que quiero consultar es sobre tal vez una de las novedades más importantes del Estatuto de Roma y la instalación de la Corte, que es la incorporación por primera vez en un instrumento internacional de derechos humanos de la perspectiva de género. Si bien teníamos la jurisprudencia de los tribunales de Ruanda y de la ex Yugoslavia que habían incorporado en sus fallos estas cuestiones, por primera vez el Estatuto de Roma dice que la persecución por razones de género y los delitos sexuales son asimilables a estos delitos más graves que condena la comunidad internacional y son asimilables a los delitos de lesa humanidad. Mi pregunta es... Eh, ¿Qué nos puede decir al respecto el Presidente de la Corte sobre cómo ha sido la marcha durante todos estos tiempos de vigencia respecto de la aplicación de estas normas tan novedosas y de qué manera se piensa desde la Corte que esto puede incidir también? Siempre reconociendo que estamos hablando de prácticas que tienen que ver de manera, eh, o de una práctica masiva y generalizada sobre una determinada población civil. ¿no? Es es la limitación que pone, por supuesto, el estatuto, pero de qué manera ustedes creen que esto va a influir también para disminuir la victimización de las mujeres en muchos de estos conflictos. Mi pregunta a la Presidenta de la Asamblea es, ciertamente ella lo manifestó, 123 países es muy importante, 123 como parte hoy del estatuto y de la Corte, pero es muy insuficiente, muy insuficiente sobre todo cuando vemos las limitaciones de acción que tienen estos 123 países. PGA ha hecho durante todos estos años un gran trabajo y un trabajo muy eficaz para promover desde los parlamentarios que muchos países se sumaran a la Corte y al Estatuto. Mi pregunta es, ¿qué más podemos hacer? ¿Qué acciones podemos llevar adelante desde la diplomacia parlamentaria, desde nuestra Organización Mundial de Parlamentarios, para tratar de aumentar ese número de miembros importante, pero insuficiente? Thank you so much, Margarita Strobitzer, from Argentina. I give the floor now to the President of the International Criminal Court. Thank you very much <coughs> indeed. The gender-based crimes they quite important role in the, in, in, in the, in the Rome Statute. Um, but what I would like to say, we are on the beginning of the long journey. Now, we are 20 this year, but 20 years in the broader perspective is really a beginning of the long, long journey. Uh, there are not many um, cases in which these norms um, have been applied, and one of the examples we, we have is the Ongwen case. Uh, this is a solid piece of, of, of jurisprudence, uh, but as you may know, this is the, the case. This is the judgment which is not final yet, it's under appeal. But you can, uh, you can find the, 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 really the, the, uh, some developments um, um, uh, and related to the, to the, um, to the gender-based um, uh, crimes. Uh, how uh, um, the, the jurisprudence of the court could, could uh, uh, decrease the victimization of, of, of women no, I think it's, it's the question which, is, which could be asked in, in, in respect to all crimes, not only to the gender-based uh, crimes. It is linked to the, to the phenomenon of the deterrence effect of the, of the statute. We believe that the statute and the activity of the court and the jurisprudence uh, of the court indeed has the deterrence um, effect. 
simple because the future perpetrator will think twice before they, they, they act, and I think it equally concerns also the um, uh, um, acts um, which could be uh, seen as a gender-based um, uh, crimes. Thank you so much. Um, I give the floor to you. Muchas gracias, eh, y muchas gracias por, por esta pregunta. Eh, sobre la cuestión de la universalidad, ahí quisiera decir que el tema de ampliar la, la universalidad del estatuto de la Corte es una prioridad absoluta de la Asamblea de Estados Partes. Es una prioridad absoluta porque efectivamente 123 es mucho, pero no es suficiente. Y no es suficiente porque la, porque la Corte es un organismo de un tratado por lo cual, y no está dotada de competencia universal. La Corte solamente puede eh, intervenir, directa o indirectamente, cuando eh, los eh, delitos, cuando los crímenes son cometidos en el territorio de un Estado parte eh, o por nacionales de un Estado parte. Es decir, no está basada sobre la jurisdicción universal. Por ello, es absolutamente prioritario ampliar el alcance de la Corte. Es una cuestión de legitimidad y de eficacia. De legitimidad porque al no poder intervenir en todas las situaciones por igual, termina produciendo un efecto de justicia selectiva, que más allá de que pueda justificarse por razones técnicas, da una percepción de que no hay justicia igual para todos. Esto ya afecta a la legitimidad y, por supuesto, afecta la eficacia del sistema. Entonces, la universalidad es vital para la relevancia de la Corte y para su legitimidad. Ahora, eh, la Asamblea de Estados Partes trabaja mucho eh, para ampliar eh, las ratificaciones. Dentro de la Asamblea tenemos eh, facilitadores, estados que trabajan en particular con, con, la, con, la, con la mesa directiva de la Asamblea para procurar nuevas ratificaciones. Aquí es uno de los facilitadores es eh, Países Bajos, el otro es Corea. Y trabajamos en conjunto, aquí de nuevo el concepto de partnerships, trabajamos en conjunto con, con Parlamentarios para la Acción Global. Eh, realmente, eh, la, Parlamentarios para la Acción Global son absolutamente vitales y coincido plenamente que han hecho un trabajo realmente fantástico para ampliar la universalidad de, del estatuto y les estamos muy agradecidos porque realmente es, una, es un apoyo, eh, digamos, esencial y que ha tenido frutos muy eficaces a lo largo de, de los 20 años de la Corte. Creo que más pueden hacer es haciendo más de lo mismo en realidad, porque lo que hacen es muy importante, que es identificar quienes pueden estar en condiciones o considerando ratificar el estatuto. Despertar el interés de aquellos que no tienen nada en contra de la Corte, pero que para los cuales no es una prioridad la Corte. Y, eh, por supuesto, ayudando a los estados que desean ratificar a entender, a comprender el sistema. Y allí trabajamos en conjunto y muchas veces participamos conjuntamente en eventos que organiza o la Asamblea o que organiza eh, Parlamentarios para la Acción Global. Eh, es además muy importante, eh, además de, de la ratificación en sí, es también ayudar a los estados en los procesos eh, de, el, de, 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 de formulación de leyes de aplicación. Eh, yo decía hoy en mi intervención inicial que solamente la mitad de los países parte eh, han eh, adoptado legislación para aplicar el estatuto y eso es, eh, es malo para el sistema, porque el sistema funciona sobre la base de la complementariedad. Entonces, las leyes son importantes, leyes donde se tipifiquen los delitos a nivel nacional y donde se establezcan sistemas de cooperación adecuados con la Corte. Muchas veces la cooperación no puede llegar fácilmente a la Corte porque el Estado no tiene los mecanismos necesarios para, para hacerla llegar. Y por supuesto, eh, los no partes pueden también adoptar legislación aunque no ratifiquen el Estatuto, porque todos ellos este, pueden 
eh, adoptar legislación, incorporar estos delitos en sus códigos penales para ayudar a un sistema de justicia más allá de que ratifiquen, aunque por supuesto sería importante que hagan las dos, las dos cosas. Eh, y me detengo aquí porque ya me están diciendo que me detenga. Gracias. Oh, this is my secret and you just exposed me. Okay, I will not use my hand anymore. I see a few others. Uh, Lord Buzies of Tweed from the United Kingdom. You have the floor, please. And after that, Petra Bayer from Austria. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning. Um, my question relates to the point that the President mentioned about capacity. The, there is consensus in the UK Parliament for the support that our government has provided the prosecutor for Ukraine. Um, I think it's now over three million UK pounds for investigative support for using technology, forensic investigation, data sharing, training. Um, I wondered whether you have an ask for all of the areas where you are in seeking support for investigations so that we can use the example of additional support that has been provided for Ukraine that we can then lobby for for the other areas of your work. Um, how confident you are that for the other areas you are receiving similar types of additional support so that when we are back in our parliaments we can be asking ministers similar questions and building on the success of that extra support. Thank you. Before I give the floor, I would like to request that you keep your questions short and also the answers, because there are many hands and we don't have so much time. Um, I give you the floor. No, it's not. Yeah. Thank you very much for this question. Before I try to answer, I, I need to make a clarification. So, um, you may know that the request of the prosecutor for additional resources were not linked to Ukraine. It was about the building of capacity of the prosecutor office in respect to all the situations. I know that um, the time co coincidence could uh, suggest that it is mostly for Ukraine, and I, I, I think that many states un so understood the, 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 what, what they did. But um, uh, indeed, uh, if, you, if you read the request of the prosecutor, the Ukraine, well, Ukraine was not used. That was for the capacity building for the office of the prosecutor. Um, uh, what more uh, can be done? Uh, I, I think that I, I used the opportunity just to express my deep conviction that um, uh, what the court needs it's the balanced, internally balanced budget. And I, I, I appreciate very much the witnesses of states to help the prosecutor to build, to build the capacity. But I think that the better uh, uh, way to deal with these things is just to support the regular budget of the, of the court. Because it is very obvious that if the prosecutor had more capacity, then produce more work for the registry and for the judiciary the court. The all the operations of the prosecutor need registrar's support. And we already now see the problems with the, uh, um, resources for the registry because uh, of course the capacity achieved by the prosecutor is bigger than before and the registry need to and need to, uh, to, to act with the resources, um, uh, the budgetary resources. And so of course the same with the judiciary because the, the prosecutor is the engine of the court's activity. You know, the prosecutor um, asked uh, judges for, uh, for issue the arrest warrants or, or, or send the cases for the confirmation of charges, then of course it, 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 it make um, uh, judges very, very, very busy. And therefore I think that the most important, important thing issue. is just to support yeah. the regular budget oh, okay. for, the, for the court. We are really, would be very grateful to the states to, to support the court's proposal in that respect. Before I give the floor to Petra Bayer from Austria, I'd like to mention that we have on the list, we have uh, Senator Alvarez from Mexico, 
Then we have Peru, we have Ecuador, we have Central African Republic, and we have Ghana. Um, but we, let's start with Petra Bayer from Austria. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a very practical question. We, we have a lot of evidence about massive sexual violence in Ukraine committed by Russian soldiers. Uh, and we know even in the chain of commands that although the high-ranking ones uh, tolerated, ignored, even uh, encouraged the soldiers to rape uh, women, children, whomever, uh, we know that sexual violence in this regard is an atrocity. It's war crime. It's, it's a crime of aggression. Uh, it's a crime against humanity. Um, and my question in concrete is those survivors of sexual violence in Ukraine but also elsewhere, what concrete um, ideas shall we give them and their, their families and, and institutions around them to really produce evidence that in the end they really have a court case, that they really can ask for justice, that they really uh, can ask for compensation, juridical protection, and, and support, so a very practical one. Thank you so much. Who would like to answer this question? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. This, the question concerns basically the activity of the prosecutor because it is the task of the prosecutor to collect uh, information on which uh, the evidence could base for the future. You know, it's uh, procedural, it's, it's basically the very simple step. If you look into the website of the court, you, you, you have the, the, the uh, uh, possibility just to share the information through the website. Uh, but it's of course for the prosecutor to make a selection of these all pieces of information he still receives. You see, it's a huge amount of, of information. There's no guarantee that every single victim will have a voice before the court. Uh, but I cannot speak for the pure prosecutor. It's up to him to make a selection and to build the case. But how it will proceed, it, I, I simply don't know. We will, we will submit the question yeah. to the prosecutor, and I'm sure that Petra Baia will get an answer from him. Now we turn to Mr. Alvarez from Mexico. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Es también una eh, pregunta hacia la presidenta de la Asamblea de Estados. Parte ella abordaba ya un poco sobre la idea. La, la primera ola de ratificaciones del estatuto y luego muy lentamente este proceso de armonización del estatuto en, en ordenamiento nacional. Y lo digo porque vengo de un país y eventualmente una región que sin tener un conflicto declarado tiene probablemente los más elevados niveles de violencia. Eh, personas desaparecidas, migrantes, eh, vejaciones sexuales, eh, que realmente entran en la tipificación de los conceptos de la, del Estatuto de Roma. Eh, quisiera pedirles si borda un poco más sobre esta diferenciación y el dilema que tenemos ahora de armonización. Usted daba algunas ideas, pero me interesa mucho si pudiera avanzar un poco más por sus respuestas y su tiempo. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Fernandez. The floor is yours. Uh, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, vuelvo al, 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 a, la, a la idea primera de la importancia de adoptar eh, legislación que no necesariamente tiene que copiar exactamente el Estatuto de Roma, pero sí es importante eh, tratar de incorporar delitos similares a los que están en el Estatuto para poder realmente armonizar eh, la legislación. Pero además, eh, obviamente que se, sin esa incorporación hay delitos que se pueden investigar y juzgar de todas maneras con otros nombres, pero sí es importante la armonización y hay leyes modelo para hacerlo, incluso en América Latina se han utilizado y PGA ha trabajado mucho en estas leyes modelos para facilitar para facilitar la tarea, no hace falta inventar la pólvora a cada vez, ya hay leyes muy interesantes que PGA este, ha trabajado mucho y que son muy útiles para nuestro sistema legal en América Latina. Thank you. Uh, I give the floor now to the representative of Peru. Muchísimas gracias. Vengo de un país hermano de Perú donde los crímenes contra el medio ambiente y la impunidad son moneda corriente. Un ejemplo es el gigantesco derrame de petróleo ocasionado por Repsol. 
en nuestro mar peruano. Y luego de un año no hay ningún directivo de la empresa española condenado con una pena y las multas millonarias. Solo tiene un carácter simbólico porque son impugnadas y al final nunca son pagadas. En ese sentido, ¿creen ustedes que en el futuro cercano podamos ver incorporado en el Estatuto de Roma la figura penal del ecocidio y si se podrá llevar al banquillo de los acusados a una empresa transnacional donde que hace mucho daño a mi, a mi país. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Uh, I give the floor to Mrs. Fernandez for an answer. Uh, muchas gracias por, eh, por plantear una pregunta en mi tema favorito, que es eh, efectivamente la cuestión de, del ecocidio. Eh, el, eh, en este, el, el ecocidio no es hoy parte de la competencia de la Corte como tal. Eh, la Corte tiene alguna competencia en hechos que podrían vincularse a daños al medio ambiente, pero de otra manera pero hay discusiones en curso sobre la cuestión del ecocidio, hay esfuerzos en curso de, de expertos internacionales definiendo el crimen de ecocidio, qué es exactamente y cómo podría ser juzgado, y esta discusión está en curso también sobre si en algún momento se podría incorporar el Estatuto de Roma. Eh, sí, eh, obviamente es un proceso largo, es un proceso extenso, la enmienda del Estatuto es un, un proceso muy complejo, pero sí hay discusiones muy serias al, al respecto. Thank you so much. Now we turn to the representative of Ecuador, Esther. Thank you, thank you, Boris. Ah, perdón. Eh, mi pregunta tiene que ver con los jueces de la Corte Penal Internacional y esta pregunta va obviamente tanto a la jueza Silvia Fernández de Gurmendi como al presidente Hoffmansky. Es si bien es cierto, son elegidos 18 jueces en la Corte Penal Internacional por la Asamblea de los Estados Parte, al fin del día son nominaciones de los gobiernos. ¿Se ha considerado poder ampliar esta socialización mientras la Corte aún debe decidir para que la sociedad civil, los parlamentos, que también tenemos una responsabilidad, en crear mecanismos de colaboración, de cooperación eficientes, eficaces, oportunos con la Corte Penal Internacional, podamos ser de alguna manera amigos de la Corte Penal Internacional, dar alguna información que podría ser relevante, importante en las decisiones que puedan tomar la Asamblea de los Estados parte eh, para, digamos, antes de, obviamente, la elección de los dos tercios de la mayoría de los votos. Muchas gracias. I see that Mrs. Fernandez would love to answer your question. Uh, muchas gracias. Una, una, una pregunta muy, muy relevante. El año que viene, en el 2023, se produce la elección de seis eh, nuevos jueces. Cada tres años se, reemplaza un, eh, se, se reemplazan seis jueces y el año que viene es la elección. Y efectivamente, Allí los estados partes son los que pueden nominar candidatos a jueces. Eh, se ha hecho ya mucho para eh, mejorar el sistema de nominación y de selección de los jueces. En primer lugar, se, eh, se ha creado un comité asesor de nominaciones, eh, integrado por expertos independientes, para eh, evaluar a las nominaciones que se presentan, se, se, se hacen entrevistas de los candidatos, para asegurarse de, de, de sus competencias y de, sus, y de su habilidad para poder estar, para poder ser jueces de la Corte. Eso es, una, eso es algo muy importante, este comité, que en realidad se creó por la Asamblea, pero que fueron en primer lugar las organizaciones de sociedad civil que impulsaron mucho este tipo de sistema para establecer algún tipo de filtro recomendatorio. Eh, por supuesto, siempre se recomienda que los procedimientos de nominación a nivel nacional tengan también la suficiente participación a nivel interno para que no sea solamente una decisión de, del Poder Ejecutivo, sino que realmente haya un, poder, un, un proceso más participativo. Además de eso, se, han hecho, se ha comenzado también un proceso para dar una mayor participación a la sociedad en general y a los parlamentarios y a todos 
de hacer eh, mesas abiertas de debate eh, para que todos conozcan a los candidatos, o sea que no sea solamente con, eh, eh, un, en círculos cerrados o con el comité asesor. Y además se están está, pensando también, estamos discutiendo y se han establecido ya sistemas este, para, para los eh, fiscales adjuntos y para el secretario, sistemas también para hacer un análisis más profundo, chequear los antecedentes de los, eh, de los candidatos y dar oportunidad a observaciones. No existe todavía esto para jueces, pero es algo que está en discusión en estos momentos en la Asamblea. Thank you. Before we continue with the Central African Republic, I'd like to give the floor to the outgoing Secretary General of PGA. Thank you, Boris. And this question of the nomination processes is very In relevant to PGA. Uh, and let me just tell you, next year, of course, the President gave us a very good overview of a lot of progress that has been done to create more transparency in the process. This is really good. The problem is that at the domestic level, I was at the United Nations last week, and two states, the biggest European, uh, Western European state in the court, and the current uh, state that is chairing the European Union, they essentially told me we already selected the candidate. One of them even introduced himself to me. So, you know, uh, <laughs> this is happening and they are picking their people and this is a little bit problematic to us because you can be right or you can be wrong. So, uh, I think this is an area where we will discuss later on in the afternoon and we will have maybe tomorrow some action points. Thank you, David. Uh, now the representative from the Central African Republic. The floor is yours. I think you need to push the button for the microphone. Ah, d'accord. Merci beaucoup. Voilà. Je suis de la République centrafricaine et uh, je prends la parole par rapport à la complex complexité uh, dans mon pays par rapport à, au travail de la CPI. La CPI est une volonté avérée de, de la communauté internationale pour lutter contre l'impunité. Et la population centrafricaine avait opté pour lutter contre l'impunité. Et la réponse, ça a été l'arrivée de la CPI dans mon pays. C'est vrai que la, la CPI est essentiel, c'est un instrument essentiel pour ramener la justice dans des pays fragiles comme le nôtre, comme le mien. Mais je parlais de complexité, c'est que pendant que la CPI est en train de faire le, les procès, les choses s'aggravent parce que nous sommes dans une situation géopolitique où d'autres acteurs viennent sur le terrain et on se demande jusqu'à quand ça va se terminer puisque ce que nous sommes en train de vivre n'est pas seulement interne à nous. J'espère que je me fais comprendre. Autre chose, la CPI a mis beaucoup de moyens en termes de communication. Le procureur l'a dit tout à l'heure, le bureau de la CPI a été fait l'effort de diffuser les procès à la radio, à la télévision. Tous les, 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 les gens, les présumés qui sont à la haie, leurs photos, c'est partout. Ça commence à conscientiser les gens et ça aide aussi à la prévention. Mais d'autres problèmes qui viennent se greffer aujourd'hui ou qui nous amène même à un recul de la démocratie, aggrave le problème sur le terrain. Alors, à travers la CPI, je, je parle aussi à la communauté internationale, comment faire pour que la CPI, qui travaille déjà beaucoup avec la Cour pénale spéciale et nos juridictions, pour amener la justice, comment faire pour que ce, ce, cet état de fait ne puisse pas freiner tout l'effort que nous sommes en train de faire. Je vous remercie.
Thank you so much. Um, which one of you would like to answer this question? I am not sure where I heard the, the question from the beginning because it was the problem with yeah, translation. We, so maybe, Mrs. Yeah. Fernandez, maybe you could, because the translation started a little bit late. Merci de, de votre question et de vos commentaires. Uh, mais je suis avec vous. La, et et c'est un peu ce que ça, et ça a été déjà dit uh, par le procureur et par moi-même. La cour ne peut pas tout faire. Ça, c'est absolument vrai. Elle ne peut pas tout faire comme cour non plus. C'est pour ça que maintenant, à la, à, à la République centrafricaine, il y a l'activité la, de la Cour pénale internationale, mais il y a aussi la Cour, de la cour pénale spéciale que vous avez mentionnée. Et ils, sont, ils travaillent en coopération, la Cour et la Cour pénale spéciale. Ça, c'est très, très bien. C'est aussi très, très bien que la Cour a fait beaucoup pour améliorer le système de communication et diffusion de ces activités, vous l'avez mentionné vous-même, pour euh, s'assurer que la population comprenne ce qui se passe au, au niveau de la justice. Alors ça c'est bien, et je sais qu'il y a une équipe des de gens qui s'occupent juste que de ça en, en la République centrafricaine, qui fait un très bon travail en matière de communication. Alors, l'autre la, partie, c'est la prévention politique, la, la, la solution politique des problèmes. Et là, la Cour peut contribuer, parce que la justice peut contribuer à la stabilisation de la situation, mais malheureusement, elle ne peut pas tout faire, elle ne peut pas remplacer le pouvoir politique et les, les choses qui doivent être faites par d'autres. Ça, c'est vraiment la communauté internationale dans son ensemble qui doit, qui doit coopérer. Mais c'est très bien déjà que la Cour la Cour spéciale, la Cour pénale et tous les systèmes de communication en place peuvent euh, vraiment faire une meilleure communication de ce qui se passe au niveau judiciaire au moins. Thank you so much. I have on my list a representative from Ghana, then from Uruguay, and we finalize this session with the representative from Argentina again. So, um, the representative from Ghana, may I give you the floor? I see a few members of parliament. Ghana. Is it on? Thank you. The Security Council adopted resolution 1325 on women, peace and security which calls for the increased participation of women and the inclusion of gender perspectives in all UN peace and security efforts. But despite much progress made in security or securing women's rights globally, a lot of women and girls still continue to, exper to experience economic and social discrimination. They are denied of equality, dignity, and even a life of their own. As I sat through the presentations this morning. Um, we've talked about strengthening our institutions, strengthening our democracy. I didn't really see the focus and the direction on gender perspective in all these um, processes. I want to find out from ICC what they are doing, what efforts they are putting in place in protecting and promoting women's rights as a responsibility. When um, extreme violence breaks out, atrocities, genocides, and all that, women and children are severely hit. As we sit here, what have we achieved so far over a decade? And what are we doing to ensure that women's rights, women's, um, women are not discriminated in terms of education, in terms of healthcare, in terms of protection? I want to find out from the ICC what they are doing, what they are putting, what effort they are putting in place to ensure the protection and promotion of human, um, women's rights as a responsibility. I heard the speak, I listened to speaker by speaker, I didn't really see the focus and the direction, the policy direction on gender perspective, how to situate gender issues in this whole process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I give the floor to Mrs. Fernandez for an answer. You would like to add? 
Thank you very much. And I'm so pleased that you asked something uh, around this issue because the gender perspective has been really uh, part and parcel of the ICC system. First, you see a gender perspective already enshrined in the treaty itself. The definition of the crimes, the new forms of violence, they are all criminalized in the statute for the first time, this gender violence against women. And uh, very recently, there has been a very important decision in, uh, in, uh, in a case in the, um, at the ICC, and maybe the president can, can speak about this, but it is extremely important from the gender perspective. So you see gender perspective in the, in the, in the substantive the, uh, legal framework, definition of crimes. There are procedural rules to uh, also ensure this gender perspective. There is also institutional mechanisms to make sure that there is a gender perspective within the court, in the composition of the court, also in the composition of the bench of the judges. Uh, the treaty itself uh, makes uh, a focus on this. So there is a lot that is done at the court on, in, in terms of gender. And actually, women worked a lot during the negotiating process of the treaty and beyond to make sure that all these provisions would be part of the, um, of the Rome statute system. Right now, the court uh, has full parity in the composition of the bench, of the judges. In the 18 judges, there are nine women, nine men, which is very, very good. Uh, and it is something that is not obvious in international courts or in national courts. So this is extremely important. And from the ASP at the Assembly of State Parties, we have special mechanisms to ensure that there is sufficient parity in the, uh, when we have elected officials at the court, but also in the composition, in, this, in the recruitment of people for the staff. So, um, so I, I think there is indeed a lot of focus on gender in terms of the, of the ICC. And let me finish by saying that I was extremely privileged to become the first uh, woman judge at the, at the ICC. So, uh, and I hope I will not be the last. <laughs> Okay, now we uh, go to, okay, let's give you an applause. You deserved it. Um, we go to uh, Uruguay and we finish up with Argentina. So first, Uruguay, the floor is yours. Eh, muchas gracias. Mi consulta y comentario va un poco en la línea de la delegación del Ecuador sobre el procedimiento de designación de los jueces. Quiero aclarar, he tenido eh, la suerte de conocer personalmente a miembros de la Corte, algunos miembros, y eh, creo que son personas de alto valor, de gran integridad, y justamente por eso creo que es un momento propicio para trabajar, rever o pensar sobre la designación de eh, los jueces de la Corte hacia el futuro. Eh, voy a dar el ejemplo del Uruguay, el Poder Judicial, los ministros de la Corte, como muchos países, creo yo, de, de esta Asamblea, son ratificados por el Poder Legislativo, son en general jueces de larga trayectoria, con mucha antigüedad en el Poder Judicial, y creo que en esta discusión de, de selección de perfiles, creo que habría que incorporar mucho más a, eh, el, a los poderes judiciales y no solamente al Poder Ejecutivo. Creo que en el mundo vamos más hacia una diplomacia eh, no solo regular del Poder Ejecutivo, sino la diplomacia parlamentaria que aquí mismo vemos representada. Eh, y tenemos, creo yo, que ir hacia más relacionamiento y cooperación entre nuestros poderes judiciales. Eh, lo largo como elemento de reflexión y de consulta para complementar el comentario de la delegación hermana del Ecuador. Gracias. Well, thank you for this question, and I hear that in the afternoon uh, we can discuss this more at length because we have a session that um, might be um, relevant for your question. So let me uh, ask one of the representatives of Argentina to ask the last question. Sí, muchas gracias. Eh, yo quisiera simplemente una opinión de ambos presidentes. Eh, fue eh, 
levantada la situación con respecto al, al crimen ecológico, al ecocidio. Eh, pero hay otros temas que no forman parte exactamente del Estatuto de Roma, de las violaciones masivas de derechos humanos, que impactan muy fuertemente en nuestra región, Latinoamérica, que son el crimen organizado, el crimen transnacional organizado y eh, la corrupción. Y hay iniciativas al respecto para crear una corte internacional que juzgue eh, delitos de corrupción y particularmente yo dirijo un, una campaña para crear una corte penal latinoamericana contra el crimen internacional organizado. Mi pregunta concreta es, existen dos soluciones, cada cual con sus ventajas y sus desventajas, que es la incorporación de estos delitos al Estatuto de Roma o la creación de nuevos tribunales. Mi opinión a título personal es qué piensan ambos presidentes a título personal de cuál de estas vías es la más eh, eficaz para combatir estas plagas. Digo, el, el impacto, lo dijo el colega mexicano, el impacto de la violencia criminal en la región es masiva. Es decir, estamos hablando de para una media de tres muertos cada 100.000 habitantes en Europa por violencia criminal, estamos hablando de entre 20 y 30, tanto en México como en Brasil, que son la mitad de Centroamérica y la mitad de Sudamérica. Es decir, es un impacto masivo sobre los derechos humanos, sobre la democracia, sobre la agenda de género, sobre todos los temas que nos preocupan a todos. Entonces, la pregunta concreta es, entre estas dos alternativas, una, nuevas cortes o incorporación al estatuto, ¿qué es lo que en lo personal prefieren? Thank you so much for this question, and I turn to your neighbor for the very last question, and the answers will be put together. So uh, the floor is your for, yours for the last question. Muchísimas gracias. Les agradezco vuestra presencia en nuestro país. Simplemente retorno al caso Afganistán en nombre del Círculo de Legisladores de la República Argentina con diputados en actividad y mandato cumplido. Hemos recibido la visita de un grupo de ciudadanos norteamericanos apodados Leopardo de las Nieves, que han hecho un trabajo de investigación muy profunda. Lamento que el señor fiscal no haya podido estar con nosotros porque podríamos haberles aportado el trabajo que ha realizado este grupo. Puedo llegar a pensar que haya algún arrepentimiento del país al cual representa, pero ellos dicen que lo hacen a título personal, en forma gratuita y con el ataque que recibe en forma generalizada la perspectiva de género en un país como Afganistán totalmente aislado de las relaciones con cualquier vinculación de otros países. La pregunta es si no toman a mal de acuerdo a su jerarquía hacerle llegar esta información al fiscal y pido disculpas por, por este atrevimiento, pero a los legisladores de Argentina, mandato cumplido y con actividad, nos conmocionó demasiado las pruebas y los elementos que tienen sobre el trato a las mujeres en el país que en este momento se apoderaron los talibanes. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Um, can I give you the floor for the answer and then you the last word? Thank you. I, I hope that I will be able to ask at least part of the questions. Um, uh, so, um, as far as this, the first question is concerned, Uh, as, as you know, it is of course up to state parties to decide whether the uh, scope of jurisdiction of the court will be broad or not. Um, there is ongoing discussion, which was already mentioned, in the ongoing mic. discussion about the um, echo side. Um, I know that also voices in favor of terrorism, in favor of, of human trafficking, of, of and uh, organized crime to be part of the jurisdiction. But from my um, uh, experience, I would say it is very long and complicated process to add something to the, to the, um, to the statute. 
uh, you know, it, it's amendment of the treaty. It, it requires ratification of many states. The process is extremely long. And I'm really not sure that there's the will of states to, 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 uh, to, to broaden uh, the, the, the jurisdiction, taking into account that uh, the capacity of the court dealing with four uh, international crimes is, is already close to, to its uh, limits. But of course, um, uh, two things I, I'd like that. The old and uh, the original initiatives will be welcome, of course. And I, this is the field of cooperation. This, uh, the, this is space for cooperation in many instances. For example, in respect to the terrorism. Indeed, the terrorism is not a crime under the Rome Statute. But some of terrorist uh, acts could be classified as elements of the crimes under the jurisdiction of the, of the statutes. But it does not mean that it is a tension between these two. According to the complementary principle, um, uh, the, 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 the cases uh, could be tried by the national courts, but by, also by the regional courts, it will be equally considered as a fulfillment of the obligation of states uh, which participate in these original initiatives. I, I, I think it, it, this is space to, to, to cooperation, and uh, from my perspective, it's probably the easiest, uh, easier way to, to, to deal with it. As for the second question, sir, I, I rather would, uh, would ask to, to, to transfer it to, to the prosecutor. Yes, of, we this will. This question could be also answered by, by, by President. But I know that PGA staff noted down all the questions that are uh, relevant for the prosecutor, yeah. and so we will take care they, that they will be submitted to the prosecution office. Mrs. Fernandez, you have the last word. Muchas gracias. Bueno, ¿cuál es, en mi opinión, ha sido un poco, cuál sería la mejor opción? Creo que las dos opciones se enfrentan a dificultades muy parecidas. La primera, y el, el presidente de la Corte eh, ya lo ha señalado, es las dificultades para llegar a un consenso. Empezando un consenso sobre la definición de las figuras que quisiéramos incorporar, sea en la Corte en el Estatuto, sea en un tribunal especial. La definición de los delitos fue en gran medida lo que bloqueó su incorporación en los 90 cuando se hablaba de narcotráfico o terrorismo como posibles agregados al estatuto. Entonces, hay allí una dificultad importante. La segunda dificultad es que este tipo de figuras, por su, por su naturaleza, a, eh, significarían, realmente tendrían un impacto muy significativo en la capacidad de la Corte, y aquí también eh, eh, lo ha dicho el Presidente, porque eh, realmente implicaría un gran aumento, digamos, de trabajo y de incluso haría falta quizás otro tipo de salas, otro tipo de personas también que entiendan en estas figuras, sería realmente una ampliación de capacidad muy importante. Pero eh, en el fondo es la misma situación si se crea un tribunal paralelo que, lo, que se ocupe de estas figuras. El tema es la capacidad. El tema es la financiación de estas nuevas instituciones. Hoy estamos, eh, y se ha dicho mucho hoy sobre el tema del presupuesto de la Corte Penal que, eh, es, eh, y las dificultades para lograr suficiente apoyo para su financiación. Incluso eh, en este momento mismo se está discutiendo porque el, la, 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 la Corte ha presentado una ampliación considerable del, 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 del presupuesto y allí lograr que se financie es realmente un problema mayor. Entonces, resumiendo, creo que hay un problema de capacidad que implica voluntad política de realmente financiar todo esto que significa ampliar capacidad y ampliar gastos, y otro que es una cuestión más ya de tipo legal que es vinculada al tipo de, a las definiciones de los delitos y que exactamente quisiéramos cubrir bajo estas figuras. Thank you so much. Uh, we come to the conclusion of this session. Before the lunch break, I would love to thank both judges, both panelists, for their very informative answers. It was very good that we had a chance as members of parliament to ask you all these questions and to be very much involved in the work of the International Criminal Court. And PGA, of course, is uh, very much on top of it 
to um, stimulate governments to be active with the International Criminal Court and the very important work that you are doing. So thank you very much. We will now go for a lunch break and we start uh, at two o'clock sharp. So we have a little bit less than one hour for the lunch break. Thank you so much.